Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for organizers for inviting me. And also, uh, I, I have to apologize for my bad scheduling. I got, you know, my schedule, uh, my talk originally was scheduled yesterday, but you know, it turns out it's not possible for me to attend, you know, come by that time. So thank you so much for rescheduling. So today I'm going to talk about submitting indicators for topological superconductors. And uh, I, did, uh, <coughs> I did this work with uh, Adrian. Uh, who is a Papalado Fellow at MIT, and uh, Ono-kun, who is still a second-year grad student, and also Yanase-sensei at Kyoto University. And these are already published on archive and also uh, from, published from PLB. So uh, if you're interested in, please take a look. So uh, this is the plan of my talk. So uh, <coughs> uh, using the first half of my talk, I will uh, introduce the notion of symmetry indicators, which, is, which has been used in search for, uh, for the material search for topological insulators. And there are uh, many different groups in the world working on this field. For example, not only us, uh, like, uh, 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 like uh, instant groups developed the theory of topological quantum chemistry, which is a very nice independent development. Also like Chen Fan group uh, at China, and uh, like uh, Japan, we also have like uh, Ken Shiozaki and uh, Sato Sensei and other people. And they are all uh, developing uh, similar theory and they are related. And uh, I, I want to acknowledge their uh, kind of you know, independent works. And uh, <coughs> also, like, uh, in the main, talk, main goal of this talk is to extend this notion of topological uh, symmetry indicators to superconductors. Already for this, there are many different uh, uh, archive preprints. So if you're interested, in, you can check, okay? So I ha first of all, I want to explain, so what is symmetry indicators? So uh, to explain that, I have a very simple uh, example of 1D spins or ring. So I have a, a XY spin, so this spin is constrained to be in plane, okay? In this setting, I have, I can define a winding number Z, that is, you know, from, a, a, you know, the, this ring, 1D ring, to the direction of spin, okay? And, <clears throat> you know, the, that kind of winding number can be computed easily by keep tracking, you know, the direction of spin, but suppose uh, we cannot do that. Then uh, there's a very easy way to see even an oddness of this winding number. To do that, I have to add a symmetry. So here, let me add a symmetry about rotation about this axis, okay? So, uh, I, this is the rota rotation axis, so spin, this spin is related to this spin. This spin is related to this spin, okay? So there's a Z2 rotation symmetry. In this setting, there are two invariant points on this ring, here and here. These points remain unmoved under this rotation. Then the direction of the spin is constrained to be either uh, right or left, right? And we can see the even oddness of the parity of a winding number, just by looking at the, these two spins, if they are in the same direction, the winding number is even. If they are in the opposite direction, the winding number is odd. In particular, winding number cannot be zero, so there must be some non-trivial winding. So, so this is like a, what we call symmetry indicator. You know, to compute the full uh, topological nature of this spin configuration, you have to keep track of all spins that and there's some additional symmetry, uh, you can reduce the amount of work, and you can just focus on two or you know, finite number of invariant points. And by computing, uh, by comparing the direction of uh, that information, you can get rough information, of, rough characterization of uh, topology. And if the uh, things are pointing in the same direction, uh, the winding number can, can still be zero, so in that case, uh, uh, we cannot say anything. You know, the winding number can be trivial or non-trivial. That's the kind of uh, like a, a disadvantage of this uh, quick method. But at least when we get, you know, uh, at least we, when we find that the spins are pointing in the opposite direction, we can say for sure that winding number is non-trivial. And this kind of phenomena really occurs in the band theory. So, uh, so we won't, so in this talk, I, I will be focusing on really just a band insulator or band uh, topological. Uh, a superconductor that can be understood within the mean field level. <coughs> so uh, the most famous, uh, in the t this type of phenomena occurring in the topological uh, insulator is really like a Fugen formula. So in order to compute the Z2 index or quantum spin hole index, uh, just by 
based on the definition, uh, it requires a careful fixing of gauge or like a, you have to compute Pathian. However, if you have an additional symmetry of inversion, then you can just compute the inversion parity of invariant points, like a, a gamma point, or x point, and if the parity multiplies it to a negative a minus one, then the topology, it, is, it suggests that you know, the Z2 index is non-trivial. So that way, you know, this is really a simple way of determining your Z2 index of topological, uh, topological uh, quantum the whole in index, and uh, we want to extend this type of notion to all two such space groups, and uh, or magnetic space groups, or you know we want to extend these things to other type of topology like a channel insulator or higher order topological insulators or ma many other type of topological insulators, and also uh, the main goal of this talk is to extend this uh, discussion to ten internal symmetries so that we can use it to, for example, topological superconductors. So that's the topic of my talk. Okay. So and. Uh, uh, we studied this thing and we performed this uh, uh, exercise to two such space groups and we found that actually the most uh, interesting example occurs in the uh, 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 inversion case. So the, the, the most interesting example I want to explain is like a, a inversion symmetric topological, uh, inversion symmetric insulator with type of symmetry and you have similarity coupling. So in this, in this setting, we found that the, class, the classification we performed gives you the result Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2 to Z4. So this is, in, uh, this is a result in three dimension. <laughs> and it was surprising to us because in this setting, we thought the classification is Z2, 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 uh, each correspond to weak TI and strong TI. However, we got Z4 and we didn't know the meaning of this. And then it turns out that this Z4 suggests uh, like a, a high order topological insulator 3D insulator with a 1D uh, uh, chiral edge mode. So our formalism can use to detect that kind of non-trivial topology. And uh, to do that, actually what we can have to do is very simple. We, ha we just have to uh, take summation of individual parity, not products. If you take products, you get plus one and you thought that this is trivial. So this insulator is trivial. Uh, in the Fouquet formula. However, using our defined formula, uh, you can just uh, take some of the image parities, and if you get two, modulo four, then it suggests that your insulator is like a, a high order topological insulator. So you can use our method in this way, and because this is very simple, and there has been a, a very nice development in the material search uh, direction. So like uh, people have, uh, people looked at the list of material in the dat database, and uh, listed the candidate of topological insulators, and there are very uh, like back to back to back uh, nature article published from uh, like a, a Princeton group and Berkeley group and Chinese group, and so these are all good. So that is why I want to kind of extend this kind of development to uh, material search for topological superconductors. Okay. So let me before doing going into the topological superconductor part, let me give you more details of this formalism. So, <clears throat> so uh, in the symmetry indicator method, we have to look at representation of band structure. So here I have some band structure, and let me focus on this set of bands. Like I, ha I have three bands here, separated by band uh, band gap, okay, below and above. On each band uh, branch, I have some character that means the symmetry representation of little group of, of this momentum. So at sigma point, I have uh, many representations, but this branch uses sigma one representation, sigma one representation, sigma two representations. So at each momentum k, uh, you can look at the little group and find which irreducible representation this band belongs to. So that you can do. So in general, uh, for each moment, high, high symmetry momentum k, uh, you first have to find little group gk and list up all irreducible representation UK alpha. And uh, for each K and alpha, you count the number of representation appearing in, appearing, you know, uh, in the band structure. So for example, in this case, you see, you say that at sigma point, you have two sigma one representations and, and one sigma two representation. So the number would be two 
and one. So this way, you just have to count the number of representations appearing in the balance structure at each momentum k. Okay? And you get that integer n k alpha, and you form a just you just uh, you know uh, arrange them into some kind of vector. This is how I characterize a single band. Okay. Uh, so for example, in two D lattice with inversion symmetry, generic momentum k will be mapped to k from k to minus k. But there are four special points: zero zero, pi zero, zero pi, pi pi. So these points I will, I will focus, and and uh, these are. Uh, parity labels, uh, that's an example. So there are many combinations, like uh, many possible combinations. For example, uh, there can be an insulator with plus, minus, minus, plus, and I will then write it this way here, okay? So this way, uh, you can get many different combinations of parities for, uh, for any possible in insulators. Among these combinations, I have to then uh, kind of judge which combination is trivial. So I have to next define what is trivial insulators. So I used to say insulator is trivial when it is smoothly or adiabatically deformed to this limit. So here I have just lattice, lattice sites, and I have atomic orbitals, but they don't hop. So they are just isolated atomic labels. There's no hopping between them, so they are kind of product states in their space. So this is just a very trivial insulator, right? Uh, <coughs> but uh, the atomic insulator is not unique, so there can, there can be multiple choice. For example, uh, like, uh, you know, if we assume inversion symmetry, then there can be four different positions in real space in unit cell where I can put an orbital. So it's like it can be just a, like a center of unit cell or center of plaquettes or center of bonds, right? They, they, they are all different positions. Also, I can put two types of orbitals, like an S orbital and p orbital, and they have different representations with respect to the residual symmetry of this point. So this point is inver uh, inver has inversion symmetry, so the inversion eigenvalue of this orbital can be plus one or minus one. So there are two different types of orbitals. So I ha in total, I have eight choices in this setting. And in a more, gen more general case, if I have more a more complicated base group uh, or a more complicated lattice, I can have more different choice of atomic insulators. And in, so in this simplest case, if I place my S orbital to the center of a unit cell, uh, then like a unit cell origin, then in momentum space, the representation combination is actually plus, 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 plus. However, if I uh, change the position to the center of bonds, then actually in momentum space, the, my inversion representation changes to plus, minus, plus, minus. And I can generate many different combinations of inversion parities by changing, changing the position of atomic lab level and also the changing, changing the nature of orbital, namely like to p orbital. So to explain you know, why the representation changes, uh, I, I have to uh, look at the wave function. So <coughs> here, I place my at atomic orbital to the center of bonds like this. So this means at momentum zero, zero, the inversion parity is plus one. So if I for inversion operation with this, this point, then plus goes to plus, so inversion parity is plus. However, at momentum pi zero, my wave function changes alternate in sign, right? So plus, minus, plus, minus. So if I perform inversion operation with respect to this point, then the sign changes, so the parity is minus one. So that way, you know, it, the, the <coughs> inversion parity of your wave function really depends on the position you place your atomic orbital, okay? Then, uh, after setting up trivial insulator, I, now I can extract non-trivial topology using, uh, by focusing on the inversion parity, or more generally, some representations. So I would say, uh, you know, let me repeat. So I would say uh, bound, this bound insulator is trivial when this band can be smoothly deformed to trivial limit. In this trivial limit, I don't have any hopping, so the band structure will be just flat. But not only that, I have some inversion, uh, I have some combination of representations. So, so this B vector, so recall that this B vector contains the information about representation combinations, like one, two, three, or like plus or minus. So that information is contained in B. I can get representation combination of this flat band, like a trivial insulator, that is A. 
And I ask, you know, while keeping symmetry and excitation gap, or this band gap, can we smoothly connect this band initiator to these atomic rebels? If the answer is yes, this band initiator is trivial. If the answer is no, this band initiator must be non-trivial. Then the necessary condition for this band, uh, this band, uh, band initiator B to be trivial is that B equals to some A. So A can be some kind of atomic, atomic limit. So that's how I use the, uh, this <coughs> uh, representation information. So <coughs> in general, I compare this, you know, many possible types of band, uh, band <coughs> insulator uh, representation combination against the combination of atomic limit. So for example, I can, I can find this combination in here, so I say a band insulator with this representation will be trivial, or I can say anything from the combination of representations. However, uh, look at this combination, plus, 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 minus. I can never find this in among atomic insulators. So band insulator with this combination must be non-trivial, and it turns out that uh, uh, 2D insulator with this combination of uh, inversion parity ha has to be Chan insulator. So this way, I, I use uh, this method. More generally, what you can do is, uh, for given uh, representation B vector, I expand it in terms of atomic representations, A. And uh, if it, it can be expanded using only the positive uh, integers, then it is trivial, or I, uh, this, this method doesn't work. However, if this expansion involves some fractional coefficient, then you can say this must be a strong TI, some kind of strong TI like Chan insulator or a strong quantum spin hole insulator. And if it involves some negative sign, then uh, it, 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 is, uh, it must be a fragile topological insulator, which is an interesting uh, class of topological insulator, but uh, today I'm not going to in the detail of that kind of things. But okay, so this is how we use uh, this method. And uh, it leads to this kind of classification, and you can perform the full classification for each, uh, uh, each setting, like uh, for each space group or for each magnetic space group. You can just go ahead and compute a possible combination of representations and get this kind of group. And you, uh, th we have the list of rep representation group in our paper. Okay, so now, uh, using the next uh, remaining 12 minutes, I will explain how to extend this story to superconductors. So to do that, I have to introduce the BDG formalism. So in the BDG formalism, I have a normal state, band structure, normal state Hamiltonian in a diagonal piece, and all the diagonal part will be just a gap of your superconductor. And you, you can implement your symmetry, like particle symmetry or space group symmetry this way. So it looks kind of uh, complicated, but there is a standard method to implement your symmetry to this BD Hamiltonian. Then, uh, so suppose your normal state band structure is like this. Then, uh, in general, your BDG, BD, BD spectrum will be something like this. So first, you invert your band structure with respect to zero, energy equals zero, so this is this dotted line will be just you know, inverted band structure, and you open gap uh, near the Fermi energy. Uh, it might be not full gap, it can be just a nodal superconductor, but in general, this is what you expect in the superconducting side. And uh, uh, one way of understanding the topology of this superconductor is to view this band, you know, BDG spectrum as a band structure and apply the previous method. And that already gives you some, topo uh, some information about topology of a superconductor, and that we did in this paper. And for example, uh, um, uh, you can uh, find a second order topological superconductor in this way. Uh, so previously people say, okay, so you have uh, Fermi surfaces, and if the number of Fermi surfaces is odd, uh, uh, the, the resulting uh, PUA superconductor is topological, and if the number of Fermi surfaces is even, then even if it is a PUA pairing, the uh, re resulting superconductor is, can be trivial. However, we found that uh, using our method, we found that uh, 
if the material have invariant symmetry, then even if the number of Fermi subsets is even, then it must be uh, second order topological superconductors uh, using our defined, um, you know, this meth method. Ah, so this is because, you know, this is like a 3D superconductor, but the surface state is like a 1D, like, you know, like a 1D Majorana mode. Usually, you know, 2D surface will be gapless, right? But so that is the case if you have only one Fermi surface. And that was people have used, like a, like a Fouquet formula. It's like a who and Sato developed that kind of uh, easy counting method. So what we are saying is that, you know, like, like you know, like, like the Z4 story, you know, you, there is a, a, actually more, something more. And even if the number of Fermi is two, um, there can be still something interesting. That can, that kind of things can be studied by uh, just view. Yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah. That's right. Uh, like a 2D surface is uh, like a gapless. That's the like, first order standard logical superconductor. And I'm saying a like, 2D surface can be gapped, but they, then you know, there will be like a 1D gapless mode on this material. Yeah, but like uh, this simple way, you know, just viewing uh, our BDG Hamiltonian as uh, just an uh, insulating Hamiltonian is some uh, very uh, disadvantage. The problem is that uh, I cannot distinguish, I cannot detect this famous Kitaev chain using our method. The reason is that, uh, so I have a Kitaev chain, and Kitaev chain has, uh, you know, like a minor zero mode to edge. But uh, in some sense, you know, this is just a trivial insulator whose uh, uh, who's one year center locates in the center of bonds. So I, I cannot distinguish uh, this uh, Kitaev chain from uh, just uh, this atomic, atomic initiator or just a band initiator. So in other words, you know, this uh, Kitaev chain in momentum space has plus parity, a positive parity at k equals zero and negative parity at k equals pi. And there exists an initiator whose parity combination is exactly the same as this. And I couldn't distinguish these two. So I couldn't conclude that this is a topological superconductor just by looking at this combination of parities. And that was my kind of, you know, uh, big, so, big problem I couldn't solve. Then uh, these papers appeared and uh, they gave, gave us a partial solution to this problem. So to understand that, uh, I have to revisit, you know, what do we mean by trivial superconductors? So I would say a um, superconductor is trivial when your BDG Hamiltonian can be smoothly deformed to vacuum. So this vacuum has this Hamiltonian, okay? So I have plus one here and minus one here and zero, zero of that in the off-diagonal piece. So what this means that I have ele electronic atomic levels above the chemical potential, so none of the ele electronic levels are occupied. And I have some whole level sitting below and so I can just say this is just a vacuum, right? So this, this is just vacuum Hamiltonian. And keeping all symmetries and keeping all gaps, if your BDG Hamiltonian can be smoothly deformed to this vacuum limit, then I would say this superconductor is trivial. And uh, for example, uh, the, the most famous you know, S-based superconductor, I have this you know, cosine uh, band structure here, and I have s wave gap. This can be smoothly deformed to vacuum limit. And uh, this is the in interpolating Hamiltonian. It's just, you know, like weighting function, cosine, sine. At t, and uh, I have to change t from zero to one. It, that brings this Hamiltonian to here. And I can do this while keeping all symmetries, like a particle symmetries. Okay? So uh, this agrees, you know, like, uh, agrees with our experience that, you know, like S-way superconductor is trivial. Also, like for Kitaev chain, I can do the same exercise. So this is the Kitaev chain Hamiltonian, and uh, because this one has some winding number, I can never uh, deform this Hamiltonian to trivial limit. However, if I have two copies of Kitaev chains, then you know, compared to this, I have tau zero here. So this is just expanded, and two by two, uh, this is like a, a four by four BDG Hamiltonian. So for this, I can find smooth path to a trivial limit. So it means that you know, Kitaev chain is 
has some Z2 nature and taking two copies of them, I can trivialize it. So this also, also agree with our you know, defini previous definition of trivial superconductor. However, we found that uh, there's some subtlety. So even for two copies of type chain, if we require inversion symmetry, then uh, the story is not that simple. So, <coughs> so I have two copies of uh, type chain. So this is the Hamiltonian. And if I look at, if I impose this inversion symmetry, then uh, I will find the parities at k equals zero is uh, both, of the, uh, both of the two bands below the chemical potential or equal zero have two uh, plus parities. And at k equals pi, you have negative parities. However, if I can deform this Hamiltonian to this, then this one have part, uh, negative parties at both k equals zero and k equals pi. So there's a mismatch of parties. So I can never connect this BD Hamiltonian to this. So this way, you know, under inversion symmetry, you can say the classification of a uh, like chain is not Z2, it's like a Z, and Z counts the number of mismatch of parties at k equals zero and k equals pi. But this is kind of wrong, you know, like a, it's like a more, uh, 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 yeah, because we know that, you know, the, uh, uh, my own edge modes are not that stable. Uh, so this, we found that this is kind of artificial. And uh, to overcome this thing, uh, we allow for adding trivial bands. So now, in addition to this type chain, we allow for adding trivial bands below the chemi chemical potential. So in this, in this diagram, red labels are all electronic, and blue labels are all whole-like labels. And there's a mixture near the chemical potential. So I, so I add an electronic label, which is atomic, so it's really flat below the chemical potential. And I ask if this entire system can be deformed into vacuum. So if I relax the condition of triviality to this level, then I can find, uh, uh, I can find a path that relates two copies of type chains to trivial. So, and we use, this is the definition of trivial superconductor, namely, you know, not only, we don't have to restrict ourselves to original BD Hamiltonian, we can add an electronic label if it is really atomic. We can add it from the below the chemical potential and ask this entire spectrum can be deformed to this vacuum spectrum. And we, <coughs> yeah, so this way, uh, we are asking, you know, if this set of representations agree with this set of representations. And uh, so previously for band initiators, what we did is to compare uh, the band B against A. So B was the representation in band initiator, and we are comparing that against uh, representation in atomic labels. Now, what we have to do in this understanding of top topological superconductor, a trivial superconductor, is that you have to uh, compare this set of representations against like A minus A bar, and A bar is the representation in the particle copy of the band. So uh, uh, if you want to see the yeah, detail, yeah. Uh, no, 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 so uh, the type chain thing, right? Uh, Uh, I see. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, so maybe you can do that, but like, uh, you know, in, in this talk, I'm not doing that. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, I guess you can do that, but uh, yeah. The thing I was talking about is just taking, you know, just taking copy and copy and copy and see if the edge state remains non-trivial. So, okay, so, uh, and yeah, so based on this new understanding of, you know, comparison of, you know, the representations below the equal zero, you know, what you have, and you compare that against this combination of atomic limit, and uh, using this understanding, we perform the calculations for all two thirty space groups, and also for uh, different uh, representations like S wave pairing or P wave pairing, we got some representation, uh, some classifications, and we got some uh, uh, new. Kind of new kind of classifications. 
but I don't think I have time to go into the detail. So what I want to uh, stress is that, you know, how we can use this method. So, so I said, you know, there are, uh, uh, you know, success of symmetry indicator method in the material search for topological insulators. So the goal of this talk was, you know, to extend that kind of things to superconductors, and we ideally, you know, we want to perform similar kind of, you know, extensive search of topological uh, materials using like DFT band structure calculations. So, uh, so this is how I want you to use this method. Okay. So I have a, some, you know, band band structure. So this, uh, which was which. Um, so particle is black. So black is original band structure you can get from DFT calculation. And then, you know, I, I can count the number of representations in this DFT, DFT band structure below your chemical potential. So this is the chemical potential, and this, you know, blue dots are just the occupied level at high symmetry points. You can count the number of each representations, right? And that information is enough to ex extract uh, the information you need in this calculation, but you have to instead assume the nature of your superconducting gap. So it, you have to use like S wave or P wave, you know, or what representation the, uh, the superconductor belongs to as an input of this calculation. Then you can determine if the topological, insula, topological superconductor is really topological or not. So you have to use two things as an input, like a DFT band, extract, band calculation, like representations, and also the nature of gap. And that combination is enough to uh, see if the resulting, topological, uh, resulting superconductor is topological or not. And uh, so at most we can do, what we can do is to get some like a uh, list of you know, possible topological superconductor for each assumed superconducting gap. So uh, yeah, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much for your attention. So um, maybe I misunderstood something, but uh, in your defined characterization of topological superconductivity, mm -hmm. topological superconductors, you introduce some trivia or atomic yeah, yeah, yeah. insulator. So it yeah. uh, sounds like very similar to the uh, fragile topology. Are oh yeah, or created, the previous, or, you know, like uh, yeah, things. Yeah. Are they different or uh, basically similar idea? Yeah, 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 similar idea. But I, I think what is what was non-trivial here is that. Uh, because of particle symmetry, uh, uh, something below equal zero, uh, uh, there are uh, you know, deep relation between something below equal, equal zero and above equal zero. And uh, just looking at something e below equal zero misses uh, very important information about the entire spectrum. And uh, this, way, this method actually like, kind of uh, see both you know, equal zero, uh, e below equal zero and above equal zero at the same time. That was kind of the key here. Also, maybe related question: If you have two key type chains, uh -huh. um, you first argue that if you keep inversion symmetry, you cannot deform continuously to three yeah, yeah, three limit. That's right. Uh, but uh, then you also mentioned that uh, if you just look at the uh, edge state, uh -huh. uh, it's Majorana, uh, uh, fermion. You might yeah, I didn't do that. Them. Yeah, I didn't do that uh, exercise myself. But uh, uh -huh. uh, because uh, uh, so coupling these edge states does not seem to break inversion symmetry. So mm -hmm. how these two uh, viewpoints are related? Maybe you Maybe there's, there's somebody who knows this. Uh, two type J and the inversion symmetry. I have two my owners, and I think I can introduce some uh, perturbation that opens the gap here. Yeah. Uh, uh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there signatures of this uh, topology, non-trivial topology, mm -hmm. in simple Ginsberg Landau theory? Are there some simple examples where uh -huh. you can look at the Ginsberg Landau uh -huh. action and then say that there is topology? Ginsberg Landau action. Because low energy physics of superconductors. Oh, Ignore the I see. Fermion part. It's well captured by Ginsberg Landau theory. Yeah, that uses order parameter that is kind of related to gap function delta, right? But just looking at delta, I'm saying, you know, 
So, you know, like people say like, P wave superconductor is interesting, but uh, I, I was just saying, you know, like a P wave, just knowing P wave, that th there are still two uh, possibilities, like trivial or non trivial. So, I'm not sure if that's enough. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, my question is related to means uh, uh, there is a theoretical prediction that if you couple uh, couple a helical edge mode in the quantum Hall state to a normal superconductor, mm -hmm. there is a realization of the topological superconductivity. So will this formalism will uh, uh, means uh, is it it will be able to classify that uh, particular phase means that topological superconductor phase with this formalism? So I didn't quite get. Uh, okay, so uh, let the, me define. So basically, in the topology, uh, there has been a prediction that if you couple a normal superconductor to a helical edge mode, mm -hmm. so there there will be a possibility of the topological superconductor. So is it possible that uh, your formalism will be uh, able to classify that? So can we understand that system in terms of like a like BDG formalism or? Uh, oh, that I don't know, but yeah, like a sound. Yeah, if you know, like a strong interaction, like interaction is like really the key, and if it's beyond me, pure, uh, that's not something I cannot deal with. But if it fits into this PDG formalism, okay, uh, I think it will be better to ask. Uh, let's talk later. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's thank Haruki for the talk. Uh,